From letters to a colleague on a rational approach to teaching. Artistic creation is a fragile, delicate, and ephemeral thing that springs forth from more than just acquired skills and that truly cannot be assessed in an entirely objective manner. Our task should thus be to promote students in their work, to encourage them, to awaken their desire to reveal and test things, and not to traumatize them and rob them of this desire. Although I understand the demands that you place on students, I'm convinced that they do not always fall on fertile soil. What stimulates one person may instead discourage another. Some people respond by truly shifting into high gear, while others decide that next time they'd rather go out dancing. The first and foremost task of an art school is not to educate elite artists, but to present young people with various possibilities and ways of seeing that they do not get from practical life. After all, it is clear that there cannot be as many elite artists as there are students at an art school. But this does not mean that the work done by the great majority of artists is redundant. And we should punish only those who clearly do not pay sufficient attention to their work and consciously fail to take advantage of all that they have at their disposal. I simply look at it other way, the other way around. Take that mountain. You write that initial awe or simpler perception comes first. Then follows the entire process that leads us towards sense, towards meaning. By comparison, I believe we need to get rid of meanings and to aim for the core, for this initial, initial law or simple perception. When we look at a mountain, we know what it is called, where it lies on the map, what role it played in history, etc., etc. But we do not see the mountain. When we see it, the important thing is not the mountain, but experience. Here I am speaking for myself personally. But I try to imagine that someone else might look at that mountain and learn what it is called, where it lies on the map, what role it played in history, etc., etc. They don't see the mountain, but they are thinking, comparing, placing it into context. Because when you're thinking, the important thing is not the mountain, but experience, through which you arrive at awe or simple perception, but not of that mountain. Ten paragraphs on the subject of how to do it. I don't know. And that is why I want to do something. Not in order to learn something. Not to master something that others achieved before me. But in order to try to explore unsensed or hidden possibilities. It is therefore more fruitful to ask than to live in the illusion that I know. Two. I don't want to be a teacher who instructs. It is not knowledge that is the most valuable thing. I want to intensely share this moment with you. I want to help so that we may experience it as strongly as possible, just like you can help me. Three, I'm not a master on a pedestal. I have exactly the same abilities as you. I cannot do any more than you. The only thing I can do is to encourage. Try that, let's do it. Four, studio work should be a collaborative effort not just between student and teacher, but also amongst the students themselves. We are all in the same boat, and let the helm be taken by whoever feels up to it at the moment. Five. Once, when talking about the name of the studio, someone suggested calling it, more as a joke, the playground. But they weren't so far off the mark. More than a classroom, a workshop, or a laboratory, a studio should resemble a children's playground. Six. You don't always have to be serious. Wild and fun play is also a meaningful possibility. The children in a sandbox take playing very seriously. Seven, laughter is very, very important. Eight, above all, we should not have any prepared program. Let's let everything flow according to its own pace. Let's observe all that comes with watchful anticipation and let's try to catch that wave. Let's allow ourselves to be surprised. Flowing water is alive, still water begins to rot. Nine, let's go to work with a full awareness that we might fail. I don't know how it will turn out, and that is what is so valuable. Let's not be afraid to make mistakes, for mistakes bring as much learning as success. Ten, 
Our work does not end when we leave the studio. Let's not divide our activities into work and entertainment. That perfect moment when something new opens itself to us can come even when we're having a beer or sitting in a cafe. Let's set out to meet at any time and anywhere possible. Art is not work. Art is a state of mind. Postscriptum. The main problem is not to find the strengths and weaknesses of how to teach. I don't mean to say that everything is perfect, but I am concerned that we might use the system's deficiencies to mask our own. Because good teachers can, if they are given the proper space and opportunities, do well even under conditions that are not entirely as they would like. And not even a perfect system can guarantee a perfect study environment. I'm not arguing for the status quo, nor am I against change, but I am warning that we must not let change become a cover. Frenetic organizational activities must not be simplified and allowed to obscure what should be the main purpose of an art school's activities. Not even the most perfect system can guarantee that instruction will hand over a truly deep and meaningful understanding and comprehension of what artistic creation means and has to offer. Only people can do that. An attempt at answering the question, is this even art? Number one, a framed object hanging on the wall is not art. Number two, this object merely has a form that we tend to place in the category of artwork. Number three, but this object is not art and, and of itself. It is merely fabric onto which someone has applied pigments in some manner, and the whole thing was then placed in a frame. Number four, art is elsewhere. Number five, art is what happens when I look at the painting, when I perceive it, experience it. Number six, art cannot be localized. Art is everywhere between the painting and its viewer. Number seven, art is therefore immaterial, ungraspable, always transcending rational and sensory perception. Number eight, a good work of art is always beautiful, even if it might not seem that way when it is being made. When I say beautiful, I mean beautiful, not pretty. Beautiful means that it does not evoke merely a pleasant feeling in our brain through our eyes, but that it reaches deeper, that it touches our heart. Number nine, anything can be a work of art. Anything that an artist calls his or her artwork. Anything they point to in all seriousness and with intense passion say, there it is, I see it, you try it too. Number 10, an interpretation of a work of art is not art. It is an aid, a guide, something like a walk and stick and solid hiking boots, but it's up to you to take the journey. Number 11, any artwork in its interpretation remains limited, bound, and complete, like an animal in a cage. But we build zoos in order to better learn from, uh, about animals and then go find the true free animal. <laughs>